Hey, happy sunshine family. Welcome back to the Lunacy Channel. It's September 6th, 2017, 12.39 p.m. Pacific Time. I've got some interesting updates and observations to bring you in the Heather Antucci Giraffe Randall Keith Bean Case. The first one is a Gematria <clears throat> observations. <clears throat> we can see from this NBCWBIR.com article uh, that we talked about yesterday, we've got the 66 here for 66 degrees in Knoxville, which is the city where this case is taking place. And the title of this article is Pair Accused in Federal Court of CD Fraud Scheme. And when I copy that, take that over here to the Gematria search engine, or the Gematria calculator, and put it in, we see one of the Gematria's English ordinal value of 382. One hundred thirteenth world series. Did I spell that right? Oh, I forgot an N. There we go. One hundred thirteenth world series. That phrase has the exact same English ordinal gematria of 382. Pair accused in federal court of CD fraud scheme, 382. 113th World Series, 382. The 113th World Series is coming up in a few months, guys. I wonder if this is somehow, this whole Heather Antucci giraffe case, if this is a tribute to the World Series, the 113th World Series. I have no idea if this is related, but I was typing in some other names associated with this case, and it just so happens that Judy Jandora has a reverse full reduction gematria of 66, and JJ J is the hmm, tenth letter, so that comes out to 11. And then over here in the ALW Kabbalah method, we have 111. That's uh, just some interesting things. I'm not, I don't know if that means anything. I don't know what meaning, if any, to assign to the Judy Jandora observation. But wow. 113th World Series and pair accused in Federal Court of CD Fraud Scheme, those match. And if you guys have watched any Gematria videos, uh, you probably have seen a lot of claims of how professional sports, the outcomes, are predetermined and scripted and announced ahead of time using the, the Gematria codes that are in mainstream news articles. I was blown away when I watched a man named Zachary Hubbard. Uh, let's actually look him up. Zachary Hubbard, it was the Cubs, Cubs World Series. There we go. This guy was, hmm, yeah, Zachary Hubbard had his channel taken down, and, and the original videos were lost. I wonder if this is, this looks like it might be a mirror, no, this is the Royals and the Mets. Well, this man here, here's a picture of him right here, Zachary Hubbard. <clears throat> I was following his channel, and last year, last baseball season, this is in spring training. He's breaking down the mainstream news articles, and he is seeing the encoding pointing towards the Cubs winning the World Series. And it was back in spring training 
that Zachary K. Hubbard noticed that, hey, if the World Series goes to a game 11, or sorry, a game 7, that's going to end on November 2nd. That's when that seventh game would be scheduled for. November 2nd is 11 month and two for the day, or 112, or 112. That corresponded to the 112th World Series. The previous year, the 111th World Series, that went to a game seven ending on the 1st of November, or 11-1. 11-1 for the 111th World Series, 11-2 for the 112th World Series, and this man right here, Zachary K. Hubbard, he announced to the world on his YouTube channel, back in spring training of last season, that the Cubs were going to break the curse of the Billy Goat, and they were going to go to the World Series, and they were going to win it in Game 7 on November 2nd. And all of that happened. And so I'm blown away that we've got a connection here between the 113th World Series and the Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe Randall Keith Bean case. We've seen a lot of other interesting observations with wordplay, nameplay. Here we've got A. Brush, who is the deputy clerk who signed the warrant. Now we found some code sections that seem to purport that, yeah, a warrant must be signed by a judge, except, except when there's an arrest warrant that comes from an indictment. Then that warrant, it, it must conform to all of these rules over here and 4B1, except that it must be signed by the clerk. And, and this was weird. Uh, I've never heard of this before. It seems like some people have. All of my training about warrants has told me that it has to be signed by a judge or a magistrate. So this was very new information for me to see that, oh, all warrants except for an arrest warrant coming from an indictment, well, that can be signed by the clerk. And then there were questions, well, this is a deputy clerk, not a clerk. And then we found some interesting websites that had very curious language that said, quote unquote, a deputy clerk has got the authority that the clerk does. Instead of, no, a deputy clerk has the, has the same authority or has the authority, but it said has got. So I wonder what's going on here with using the internet as a research tool. I, I wonder how reliable it is. Uh, one of the first ideas that popped into my head when I very, hmm, let me, when I first heard of the Mandela effect, especially with the Berenstein slash Berenstain bears or interview with a vampire versus interview with the vampire, both of those are totally contrary to my memory. It was Baron Steen Bears for me, and it was Interview with a Vampire. Interview with the Vampire doesn't make any sense as far as the storyline to me. So, I wondered, wow, is this Mandela effect some sort of a PSYOP weapon that can be used to change a repository of recorded reality in real time. And, and I don't know if there's any way that I can verify
just using the internet here, if if this law here, we're talking 9B1 that says that it must be signed by a clerk. I mean, this is federal court here. It's the only time when you're going to have grand juries and, and indictments as in federal court. So I just don't have the experience to, to say whether or not this is always been this way or if this is a recent change. I don't know. But the question I have is if this has been this way for a while, at least since before 2009, then why do we have a standardized form used by the United States District Court employees and officials that the boilerplate form had its last revision of January of 09 and that as part of that boilerplate form US Magistrate Judge is pre-printed for the title Rule 9B1, it says it must be signed by the clerk. There, there's no mention of a judge in here. It, this makes it sound like, wow, if a judge signs a warrant coming from an indictment, that that's invalid. So, an extension question is, is a judge even allowed to sign a warrant that comes off in an indictment, a grand jury indictment? And if not, if a judge isn't allowed to, like if it must be the clerk, then why is U.S. Magistrate Judge filled in? So I have a hard time reconciling that. The, the, these are the kind of questions that pop up that really make me feel like there's a lot of funny business going on here. Okay, I want to give another open announcement of love and kudos to the same person who wrote the letter to WBIR making some observations and asking questions. Hey, who wrote this article? The same person has written a letter to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners Knoxville chapter. <clears throat> and I'm going to read that to you. Greetings. I'm reaching out to you today in hopes of clarifying some questions I have concerning one of your previous key speakers from your April 2015 monthly meeting. Apparently, Special Agent Parker Still from the Knoxville branch of the FBI spoke about identity theft and other white-collar crimes during this meeting. I have reason to believe that somebody may be using his name and credentials, ironically without his knowledge. I am hoping you may be able to give me as good of a description of him as possible. This all may be for nothing, but I want to make sure for myself before I make any detrimental assumptions or statements. Any assistance <clears throat> in this matter would be greatly appreciated. Also from this same member of our family, We've got some interesting investigations and thought work going on here. I just paid for a relatively non-helpful background check on Parker Still. Feel free to use any of this information that may be pertinent. <clears throat> also, I called the JAG School in Charlottesville, Virginia, 
and confirmed what I thought. They were unable to give me any information about any past graduates. Part of the reason is because they don't know who I am and the other item I would have to have is Parker's social security number. How ironic. Not to mention a written reason why I was searching for this particular person's information. One item I came to discover which I was unaware of is that people who attend JAG school already have to be licensed and have passed a bar exam before admittance. I was under the impression that JAG was like a military law school. Apparently you have to have an undergraduate take the law school admissions test or LSATs and attend an ABA approved law school except for California. On a side note, I think Wisconsin and New Hampshire allow the practice of law in, in the state without passing a bar, from what I understand. And then we're just going through some general mathematics and seeing if Parker's birth date and his experience and everything, seeing if all of that adds up. And initially, well, we found two different possible ways to add things up. And, and we're not sure which way is the proper way. One seems to correspond with his testimony. <clears throat> uh, and the other one, the other one's leaving us, uh, wow, he didn't. He didn't have enough time to, to cram all this in into this time period. Uh, and, and we're just not sure, but I'm going to read you both scenarios. So if Parker was born in 1978, then he would have had to attend college somewhere approximately 97, 98 to 2001, 2002, roughly, given he went right into college and was there for four years. Then he would have had to attend the ABA accredited law school for at least three years. So this is 0405 ish. Once completed, he would have had to spend a minimum of four years in the military, which would have put him discharged from active duty at about 0809. Then there is the seven and a half years of practicing law, about what, 2015, 2016, and then five years at Knoxville FBI field office. This takes us to 2020 or 2021. Maybe we found a discrepancy here. Does anyone have a photo of Parker? I could certainly believe the others could piece together a quick background for his character in this drama with real names and information, but I would need to see photo identities of him and witnesses who can verify he attended law school and military JAG. So, as I pointed out in my September update video, or recap that the only image that I have seen that is could possibly be Parker still was on Neil Wolf's video that he took when he was walking from uh, one building to another uh, over in DC uh, it was a bald man and well let's see I think I've got I may still have that that video still up. Let's see. There. There we go, guys. This is the only photo that, that we really have that it's not verified yet if this is Parker still, but this is this is our best <laughs> our best visual evidence of the man that Neil Wolf thinks is Parker still. And that's the best that we can do. So if anybody's got a photograph out there, if anybody knows Parker still, uh, apparently he's got a whole lot of addresses all throughout Mississippi. Um, I know there's other people that have been looking into the Mississippi side of this, and they're coming up empty. All right. I've added another file it's the detention hearing transcript from Knoxville, Tennessee on August 29th. That's in my publicly shared Hat J folder. The source of this was Taryn Cognito's blog spot. 
and he's redacted some of the personally identifying information for, where does he say it? He's redacted the address and phone number of Heather's host. So that's another transcript uh, that we can, we can put in line and make some more observations from. So I'm not sure <clears throat> if I were to draw an imaginary line around the entire experience of Hat J and where it's connected in, I'm just not sure how big of a loop I would have to draw. We've got some strange things with the names like Parker Still, <clears throat> Park Her Still, does that mean Park Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe Still? Uh, giraffe, J-A-R-R-A-F, sounds a lot like the animal giraffe which has a very long neck. Is Heather sticking her neck out? Uh, we've got this character that's been associated with Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe and RKB, uh, Harvey Dent. And that's also a name from a Batman movie of a character who turned into the villain Two-Face. And we see a lot of drama going on right now that seems to be centered around Harvey Dent. We've got the name A Brush. Like, are we brushing off a warrant here? And then even Tucci, T U C C I. Well, T U C C I is very close to U C C 1, which is the form that uh, is, is referenced so often by Heather herself. And she's filed many U C C 1s. So, we've also had a Hurricane Harvey, and, and that's the same, you know, the same first name as Harvey Dent. And when you look up the etymology of the origins of the name Harvey, and also of the other hurricane that's threatening the United States, which is Hurricane Irma, both of those names have meanings that are derived from and around war and battle. <laughs> I'm just not sure exactly what all these observations mean, but there's some interesting nonlinear logical connections that are taking some major events going on in the now moment and and tying them together in a way that's leaving me scratching my head so you guys have some more transcripts to read you got a lot of UCC records to dig through um, I'm it's evident that there's an awful lot of intelligent and articulate people out there I'm getting some great emails This is what it takes to, to get through this, guys. We make observations, and we ask questions, and then we make more observations. And those subsequent observations are either going to answer questions, or they're going to bring more questions. And when these observations keep bringing more and more and more questions, especially within the environment of our criminal justice system, to me, that means that we're unwinding deception. When the observations we start making answer questions rather than creating more questions, that's when we know that we're picking out the truth. But all we can do in the meantime is know that it feels like there's deception afoot because all our observations just lead to more questions. And when you're in that cesspool 
of murky pea soup fog, of darkness, the only thing you can do is make observations and see if they answer questions or if they bring more questions. So check out the Dropbox. Keep sending me email. Lunacy, L-U-N-A-S-E-E -E, at ProtonMail.com And we'll be back with more. Whatever it happens to be. I love you guys a lot. We'll see you soon.